check one, two. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna do it like this today. I think what I have done is I have forgotten to change the batteries on my microphone that's on my ear. Um, and so I'm seeing a yellow light, not a green one. That's not good. Now, when you see a yellow light, how many of you are tempted to go faster? <laughs> yes. That does not go well during Roundup. Please refrain. Yes. And this morning, I was driving down the street, and I see all of these things down the middle of the road saying no parking. Right? <clears throat> how many people do you figure were... Uh, listening to this no parking thing that was going on, <laughs> right? We have parking everywhere. There's going to be a parade. Maybe your car will be, you know, towed. Or actually, you'd be fortunate if it was towed. It might be attacked by a bull. <laughs> you know, like, who knows? You might have some, uh, you might have some um, hoof prints in, in the, the hood of your car. So it's interesting because in this life, we all get warning signs, warning signs, warning signals. Some of them come in the form of yellow lights that are telling us that soon the intersection will be filled with cars going in the opposite direction. It will be bad if you're in the middle. Sometimes people say you shouldn't park here. The reason is, is because there's going to be a big parade coming down the street with wild animals that might decide that they like your car more than you want them to like your car, right? And in our lives, each and every single one of us have been given plenty of instruction in the Bible. And now, many of us end up often characterizing instruction in the Bible as the things that we shouldn't do, right? We look at the Ten Commandments of God, and we hear the thou shalt nots, right? And many of us end up looking at these things, and we say to ourselves, I promise you, God, I have many times told a lie. I have many times coveted my neighbor's things. I have many times done this and that, but God, I promise I'm not going to anymore. How many of you have had a thing that you said, I'm not going to do it anymore. I promise God, I listen, I'm not going to lose my temper, right? One of those uh, local Christians that has the um, Jesus bumper sticker. Are we on? Oh, look at that. Can I just say amen for our uh, sound team here today? Can, let's, let's please, let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. And, and, and I have to say a double amen because we have... I, I want you to notice something that's happening in our church. Please amen with me to this. In our church today, we have a young person up running the live stream. Yes, we have young people helping remove microphones from the stage. We have young people helping take up the offering. We even have pastors who think that they are still 10 <laughs> and trying to compete with children to see how many dollars I can get. Eventually, if you pray long and hard enough, I will not run your children over while trying to get the dollars from them. Okay. I apologize. But I just want to say amen because it excites me so much to see all of the young people getting involved in our church service and helping out with the sound equipment and the live stream. And I'm telling you something. Um, they know how to run this stuff better than I do, and that's <laughs> a sign of my old age. But anyway, all right. So, we often think about the things that the Bible tells us not to do, but I would like to suggest this morning that as we look at God's Word, it is better of us to look at the things that God tells us that we should do. How many of you like to be told no? Jack likes to be told no. He's the only one here today. He raised his hand. <laughs> I know that for some reason, and I know many of you will identify with this, even those of you who are listening out there on the live stream this morning, I hope that you're hearing me and picking me up right now. 
because it seems to me that when the light turns yellow, I want to go through the intersection right now even more than I did before. And when it says, you can't park here, no parking on this street today, for some reason, that is the one street in town that I really want to park on. I don't know if you remember when you were little and your parents said, okay, nope, you can't have that. You can't have the candy, but you can have the watermelon. What did you want? You wanted the candy. Suddenly, even though normally you would have been happy to have a delicious piece of watermelon on a hot summer day, suddenly you want the candy and you don't even like the, I'm not even eating the watermelon. <laughs> I don't care if it's seedless. I don't care if I even get the best part. I don't want it because I've been told that I can have it. The thing that I can't have, I want. Hmm. All right. So today, we're going to be talking about prayer. Prayer. This is something that the Bible tells us that we can't do enough of. We can literally spend our entire lives praying. We can pray all the time, constantly, without ceasing. However, friends, I would like to suggest to you something. If prayer is merely a formality where we pray over our food or we pray during a religious service or let's say that we even actually take time praying in our prayer closet, if prayer is something that we only do in those religious services, we will end up missing what the Bible is telling us when it says pray without ceasing. Ellen White in um, Steps to Christ, chapter 11, called The Privilege of Prayer, says, it is not good for men and women to give themselves so much to prayer that they become like a monk. Why? Well, if you ever decided that you were going to lock yourself away, let's say that you said, I'm going to lock myself away for 10 years to pray. How many of you here today would like to lock yourselves away in a room alone? Somebody will bring you uh, once in a while a morsel of food. You might have a candle and some incense, and you're going to be in a, a room that is kind of cold and damp. I imagine that it uh, has a stone floor, very uncomfortable to kneel on, and uh, it's a house made out of rock, and you will be there alone in that room for 10 years praying. That's all you're going to do. How many of you would like to sign up for that? Please come and talk to me after church. Nope. Anyone want to come forward now because you're so excited to spend 10 years alone in a room? Now, why do you think it would be a bad idea to do that? What do you think? Think about it for a minute, okay? When you come up with an idea, you just raise your hand again and tell me. Creature comfort. Huh? Creature comfort. How can you serve if you're locked in a room? Here's what Ellen White says. She says, if we give ourselves so much to religiosity and prayer that we lock ourselves away like a monk, soon, even though we are alone in a room, we will cease to pray. She says, because the very content of your prayer will run out. It will be zero. Because you are no longer interacting with other human beings, which is what we have been designed to do. I know that for me personally, in my own life, my prayers, as I continue to do the 40 days of prayer, become a lot less about me and a lot more about others. You see, um, if we actually open up Steps to Christ and we go to chapter 11, by the way, this week our Pathfinders got together for our first in-person club meeting and we studied this chapter, The Privilege of Prayer. We're working on a prayer honor and your Pathfinders are all praying uh, along with us during the 40 days of prayer that we're doing right now that God will pour out his Holy Spirit on us and give us a vision for our lives as individuals, as a church, and as a conference. But here's what it says. In comment to what is prayer, 
I don't know about you, when I first heard that we were going to go to a prayer meeting and we were going to spend an entire hour praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit with my grandparents on a Wednesday night at the Hoodview Church, I thought, how in the world are we going to pray for an entire hour when it seems to me merciless, the 15-second prayer that we pray at potluck over the haystacks? Right? We're all, yes, amen. Thank you. How in the world will we spend an hour? What are we going to say after the first 60 seconds? And at the time, I had no idea what prayer was. I thought prayer was some formal thing that I did, and I had to say certain words at the right time, in the right place, for the right service. And if it didn't all come out just a certain way, then I would be embarrassed and I would feel bad. Am I the only one that's ever felt like, oh, please don't call on me to pray? I know once I became a pastor, I actually felt that way even more because it seemed like every time I walked into a room, oh, the pastor is here, he will do the prayer. What are we praying about? Sudden panic. I don't even know. Okay, sure, I will do the prayer. What do I say? Oh, God, help me to know why we're praying. <laughs> I don't even know. But this statement right here in the chapter of the privilege of prayer, which is chapter 11 in Steps to Christ, this statement right here absolutely blows my mind and it helps me to be more passionate, more fervent about prayer because it helps me to understand the reason for it. Check this out. It says, prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend, not that it is necessary in order to make known to God what we are, but in order to enable us to receive him. Prayer does not bring God down from heaven to us, but instead it brings us up to him. I remember almost 21 years ago now, I believe, 21 years ago. How many know what happened 21 years ago in the month of September? I was skipping school. You can probably tell me your story too. You can tell me where you were, what you were doing. I was skipping school. I was eating Fruit Loops, watching TV. I think it was Inspector Gadget. And suddenly the program changes. And I see the most peculiar thing that I've ever watched in my entire life. I think I just watched a plane fly into a building, an entire, this huge aircraft. And in that moment, everything in life changed. But how many of us right now in this very moment really sense the significance of that event now? I remember watching on TV as people were running through the streets terrified. Smoke. Faces covered in dirt. Emergency responders running towards the epicenter while everyone else is running out. Amen. And thinking to myself, I think I better pray. I think I better pray. And at that time in my life, I could not have been further from God in my heart or in my life. But the moment I saw that plane hitting that tower, the moment I saw the people running, the moment I saw the responders rushing, the moment it seemed like everything we knew in our world was being turned upside down, suddenly in that moment, I saw my need for God. A similar thing happened at the beginning of COVID-19. A similar thing happened at the beginning of COVID-19 in my life when I started to live inside of a room alone. And I had people telling me that if I went outside that I would absolutely 100% get sick and die. And at the very beginning of it, it was terrifying because none of us knew anything about what was happening or why or how long 
it was going to last. I remember laying in my bed, praying to God that someday we would be allowed to come outside again. I also remember in the month of June coming here a year ago, a little over a year ago now. In fact, actually, we're coming up on 15 months, believe it or not. I can't believe it. Has it been 15 months since I arrived? Friends, when I came here, the reality of what was going on in our world was completely different than it is now. But what I have noticed is, is that in the moments of trial that we face, in the moments of terror, in the moments of pandemic, in the moments of financial insecurity, in the moments when our health is failing, in the moments when something is happening that is unpleasant, we suddenly realize our need for God. But those moments in which we realize our need for God, once we move away from that event that happened, seem to lose their effect on our life. Recently, I have been going through personal health challenges. I've talked about it several times, where um, just a few weeks ago when my mom was here, I was standing out in the foyer, and suddenly the room started doing this. I started feeling pain in my chest. I started getting dizzy. I thought, what's going on? I've got to give a sermon momentarily. <laughs> so I decided to go in my office and breathe, <laughs> right? Sit down and breathe. And what am I doing? I'm praying. God, give me the strength to be able to go out and give the sermon. Well, just a couple of days ago, um, I was able to consult with a doctor and things and get cleared to get a chiropractic adjustment. And they said, well, there's not a whole lot we can do for stenosis in your neck other than give you a steroid, which we can't keep you on forever. Um, you can also get chiropractic adjustment. You can get trigger point injections. You can get chiropractic care and massage. I tried the trigger point, adjustment, uh, trigger point injections, and when I got the injections, my heart rate went way down below the 40s. My blood pressure dropped significantly, and they were worried they were going to have to rush me to the emergency room, and so they said, we're not going to do those anymore on you. <laughs> so just a couple of days ago, I was able to go in and see a chiropractor who does traction, and they took a seat belt, strapped me down to the table, put a sling around my neck, and then they pull. <laughs> and I felt my body like an accordion. It was doing this. <laughs> and suddenly I was one inch taller, which is good news for me. <laughs> and it was so crazy. Because after several months of being in pain all the time, of having weird uh, muscle spasms going on, which felt like my heart, suddenly I got up off that table, felt like I was one inch taller, and pain was gone. Strength returned. Walked out of that office, got into the car, zipping down the road. Ha! And just like that, my problem is solved. But I noticed something. I wasn't aware, as aware of my need for prayer on the way home from the office as I was on the way in. Why am I talking at length about this? Friends, I think so often in our lives, we sense our need for prayer during times of trouble. We sense our need for prayer when we are having financial struggle. We sense our need for prayer when we are going through a illness. We sense our need for prayer when a tragedy happens. But when God takes care of the problem, 
when God comes in to the rescue, then suddenly we forget our need for God. I would like to suggest that maybe the solution to our problem is realizing that prayer is not just asking God for what we need, but instead, prayer is intended to draw our hearts close to God so that we can see the needs of people around us. I remember um, when my sister was living in a drug house in Idaho. I had no idea where she was, so I decided to reach out to her on Facebook to try to find out where she was. She sent me an address. For 13 years, I had been praying for my sister. 13 years praying for my sister. As a young lady, she had dropped off her daughter with my mom, gotten in the car, drove away, and had literally been out there on the streets using drugs, who knows where. So I found out that she was in Idaho, and I got a hold of her via Facebook Messenger, and eventually she wrote back to me, and I was sitting in my office one morning praying for my sister. 13 years of praying. How many of you have prayed for a loved one for a very long time that they would give their hearts to Jesus? How many of you, after praying for a very long time, have felt like, hmm, I wonder if maybe my prayers just bounce off the ceiling and come back down, right? Because what's happening, right? Well, one day I'm sitting in my office at Pasco Riverview Church at my first church, and I'm praying, and I turn around, and I see the book, The Purpose Driven Life, sitting on the shelf. And God impresses me. Stephen, buy that book for your sister, buy her a Bible and a journal, and send it to the address that she sent you. So I go down to Barnes & Noble. I find the books, a Bible, a journal, and The Purpose Driven Life. At the time, they only had it leather-bound. $125. Now, how many of you would want to go ahead and hand out glow tracks if every glow track cost $125? Right? But for the person that you've been praying for all of these years, what's $125? Right? And so I said, okay, here we go. I buy the books, put them in a package, and send them to my sister in Idaho. About four weeks later, maybe six weeks later, my phone rings, and it's my sister. She's sitting in a Walmart parking lot. She says, I'm in Washington State driving towards a women's center. I'm going to go stay in a women's center where I'm going to be safe. I've got my kids here in the car. And she says, you'll never believe what happened. She says, I had gone in to my boyfriend's room and opened the top dresser and inside I saw a book and on the front of the book it said, why on earth am I here? Question. She wondered what the book was so she asked him when he came home from work. She said, what is that book in the top dresser? And he looks at her and he says, I absolutely forbid you to read that book. Can't read it. Three days later he goes to work and a package arrives. My sister opens the package for me, and inside is a book called The Purpose Driven Life, and right on the front it says, Why on earth am I here? The very book in the top dresser that she wants to read. She said, Brother, by the time I got to chapter 3, I was looking at my kids, I was seeing the situation that I was living in with the drugs, with the abuse, and everything that was going on, and I realized that these little children that God has entrusted to me are in my care and it was time to leave. She says, I got my book and the few belongings I have and I'm in a car and I'm coming home. Before I left Pasco Riverview at the end of my two years there, I got to baptize my niece Aubrey and my sister Rebecca. Amen. Because the first thing that Aubrey said to her mom when she saw her mom for the first time in many years 
My sister drives into the parking lot. Aubrey comes out of the house. She gets out of the car, and then Aubrey sees her mom for the first time in years. And I'll never forget seeing this on Facebook because somebody was filming it live. Aubrey comes running across the gravel driveway. That's my mom. That's my mom. That's my mom. That's my mom. Let me ask you a question. Do you think now on this side of this story that I feel like any of those moments of prayer for 13 years were a waste? There's a story in the Bible, Luke chapter 17. I'm sorry, Luke chapter 18, 1 through 8. On the parable of a persistent widow. How many of you have heard this story before? Parable of the persistent widow in Luke chapter 18. Starting in verse 1 and going through verse 8. I'm just going to read it for you. It says, Then he spoke a parable to them, being Jesus, that men always ought to pray and not lose heart, saying, There was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now, what happens when you have a judge that does not fear God nor regard the people that he is judging? Right? He's there for the paycheck. <laughs> and he doesn't really care whether you're guilty or not. <laughs> he doesn't fear God. And, by the way, if you have an unjust judge, then they'll usually pass judgments for bribes that gain them extra favor. Now, there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Okay, all of us know that if somebody keeps bothering you long enough to get justice for them, you are eventually going to do something about it. Even if you don't care. And clearly this judge didn't care, did he? But he says, listen, if I don't do something for this widow, she's going to keep coming and bothering me. But here's the part that's more important. It says, then the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said, and shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes... Will he really find faith on earth? What is this saying? It's saying if an unjust judge will give you what you're asking for, how much more will God give you justice who gave his only begotten son to die for you? Friends, I think that we often neglect to pray because we have a problem with doubt. We have a problem with doubt. We don't doubt that God hears what we pray, but I often think that we doubt that God loves us. I think often we doubt that God hears us. Often we doubt that if we ask God for what's on our heart, that he will hear us and actually do something about it. And I think the reason we have this doubt is because we have forgotten that God loves us so much that he gave his only begotten son to die on Calvary's tree that whosoever believeth on him will not perish but have everlasting life. God faced for you and me the most scary foe that any of us will ever face and that foe is death. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul tells us that when Jesus comes again, that he will actually before our eyes demonstrate his power by defeating death, which he's already done, but he will actually put an end to death once and for all, asserting that he is the savior of the universe who came, lived, died, resurrected, and is sitting at the right hand of God in heaven, interceding, how often? Day and night for you and me. Let's turn to our passage for today.
book of Matthew. Chapter 26. And here in Matthew chapter 26, we see Jesus praying in the garden of Gethsemane. Let's start in 2636, and it says, Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. How many of you have ever been in trouble before? And when you were in trouble, you wished in that moment that some of your friends would come close to you to comfort you. But what is it we experience in life when we actually are going through some of the hardest battles in our life, when we are going through struggles, when we are going through pain, when we are going through sickness, when we are going through financial struggle, when life is falling apart for us and those around us are not experiencing that same thing? What's the tendency? Is the tendency for all of us to go, ooh, 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 I want to have that problem? I want to take care of that thing? Or is our tendency to start to kind of, eh, <laughs> I don't know. Eh, you know, it's cool. I'll, I'll be over here. But when things are going good again, right? I mean, think about it. Jesus riding into the city. Everybody's there. Hosanna, you're so great. Ooh, he's doing miracles. He's healing people. He's feeding people. Look, he's so amazing. We want to be there right at the heart of the action. And so here's Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. The weight of all of the world, all of the sin, all of the problems, all of the stress, all of the people you pray for, everything in the universe is bearing down. And he gets his three disciples who are his closest friends and he says, will you please come and be with me in this moment? Do you realize how sacred it is when someone reaches out to you in their moment of desperate need? Do you realize that if a person is reaching out to you in their moment of desperate need, that they actually consider you to be the one person who just might care? Jesus calls his three closest disciples and he tells them, I am feeling so much stress. I am feeling so much pressure. I am feeling so much sadness. I am feeling so much weight that I feel like I'm going to die. Spirit of Prophecy tells us that if the angels would not have come to strengthen Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, that he would not have even made it to the cross. That's how heavy the weight of our sin and guilt that was pressing down upon him was. So then he went a little farther in verse 39. He fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will but as you will. Friends, how hard is it to pray that prayer? When you see a trial coming your way, how hard is it to pray, not my will be done, but yours, God? I'm going to trust you, God, whether it goes my way or not. I'm going to trust you whether I'm feeling good or not. I'm going to trust you, God, whether I got money in the bank account to pay the bills or not. I'm going to trust you, God, even if I've prayed for that loved one and, and they've never come to church. I'm going to trust you, God, no matter. God, whatever your will is, I know that you're good. I know that you're working. I trust you, God. Your will be done, not mine. And how hard is it to pray, Father, your will be done, not mine, when if it's God's will for you to lay down your life for everybody else? You see, and the interesting thing about our lives as Christians, friends, is God doesn't ask each and every single one of us to go and die on Calvary's tree. He doesn't ask us to carry all of the sin, the anxiety, the depression, the pain, the sickness of every single person on the planet Earth. But what he does ask us to do is lay down our lives so that he can live in and through us to reach the needs of the people around us 
that he has called us to bless. You see, the interesting thing about our lives is, is that Jesus died so that we can live, and we have a choice about what we will do with the life he has given us. We will either live our lives selfishly, or we will live our lives in surrender to Christ. We will pick up our cross and follow him, and we will say, God, use my life. I surrender my life. I lay down my life, though I live, so that Christ can live in me and bless others. Okay, so let's just look at what happens here in the rest of this scene. Jesus is pouring out his heart to the Father, and then in verse 40 it says, Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping, and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Friends, I have to admit that during the 40 days of prayer, I get to the church in the morning, I open up my email, I read the section of Acts that I need to read for the day, I read my devotional, I spend about 15 minutes praying. And there are times, there are mornings when I'm thinking about emails, when I'm thinking about work, when I'm thinking about what I got to go do here, there, and everywhere else, where it's hard to actually even take 15 minutes in prayer. But you know what? There's something interesting in this verse. Matthew 26, 40. It says, When he found the disciples sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me and pray one hour? What was his reason for telling them to pray? What was his reason for telling them to pray? Was it, pray because I want you to relieve the burden that's on me? Pray because I want you to save me? Pray because I need you to help me? Pray because of what, I, I need you to pray because it's all about me? No, what was it about? Pray lest you enter into temptation. You see, so often I hear people preach about the Garden of Gethsemane. I hear people preach on prayer. I hear people preach about the fact that the disciples were sleeping, and it's like they're rebuking them because they didn't help Jesus. Jesus wasn't asking them to pray to help him. Jesus was asking them to pray because he knew that what was happening to him was going to eventually happen to them. He says, the enemy will strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. Jesus knew what was coming. But I got a question for you guys. How many of you are tired of the enemy coming along and just wiping you out no problem with the temptations he's bringing you away? How many of you are really actually getting tired of living in a world that is not our home? How many of you are sick and tired of seeing the pain, the death, the dying, the sickness, and the sorrow? How many of us are sick and tired of events like 9-11, pandemics, wars and rumors of wars, human trafficking, children starving to death every night while we're at home at, safe in our beds? How many of us are tired of seeing people suffer? Jesus has called each and every single one of us to pray, not because he wanted us to save him from what he was about to do, which was give his life for us, but because he wants each and every single one of us to be strengthened by him in the gift he has given us so that we can be used by God to make a difference. And so the title of the sermon today, it's a simple question. It's a simple question, friends. I'm not just asking it to you. I'm asking it to myself. Here's the question. Jesus comes to the disciples. He finds them a third time, and he just has a question. I can hear his, in his voice. Are you still sleeping? Yes. 
You know what the problem is? The problem is, is that the book of Revelation chapter 3 is right. Jesus was right. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And I have to be honest with you. As I'm doing this 40 days of prayer, I am crying out to God and I am saying, God, change my heart. Last night I was sitting in the church parking lot. I spent half the night sitting here in the office praying for this church. And I got to the point where I was feeling tired, so I decided I'm going to go out in my car and I'm going to go home. But before I went home, I felt impressed to do something. I felt impressed to take the car, drive it up around the top, and just park it above the city. And I parked my car above the city, and I kicked my seat back, and I opened up the sunroof on my car so I could see the stars. And then I positioned myself so that I could see the stars out of one eye and I could see the city out of the other. And something amazing happened, friends. I laid there in that car and I started talking to God. And I felt his presence right there with me in that car. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know who you're praying for. I don't know what your struggle is, but I know each and every person listening to the sound of my voice has one. I know each and every single one of us sitting here today have the same enemy that Jesus was facing in that garden that night when he was asking his disciples to pray. And I also know that if we don't take the time to pray and to go to Jesus, that we will not have the strength to resist the devil when he comes against us with his temptations and his attacks. But more than that, friends, I also know that if we will not spend time with God in prayer, if we will not pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, if we will not now come to the place where we realize that our church is in an entirely Laodicean condition and that we are in need of God's love and his strength being poured out in our life, then the trials that are coming in the near future, when they come, will scatter each and every single one of us. We need the love of Christ for each other to be poured out in our hearts, our minds, and in our lives. Or when the trial comes, it will be every man for himself. Friends, are you still sleeping? Do you see the things that are going on in our world today? How much longer? How much longer? How much longer does Jesus have to wait before we will cry out to him and wake up from our slumber? I don't know about you, but I want to go home. I don't want to have to bury another, I, I don't want to have to have another memorial or funeral. I don't want to keep going to the hospital and holding the hands of people whose organs in their body are failing. I don't want to have to keep watching as wars and rumors of wars are happening. I don't want to keep watching as people are struggling financially and inflation is going out of control. I don't want to keep watching as our world spirals out of control and gets worse and worse and worse. And friends, as Christians, I think it's time for us to remember that Jesus gave his life for us so that we could be empowered, so that his kingdom can come and his will can be done on earth as it is in heaven. So often, we, we end up we end up praying that Jesus will come again, forgetting that he wants to come into our lives now so that he can be with us in the trial. Friends, will you join me 
Today we are on day 10 of the 40 days of prayer. Will you spend the next 30 days of this time of prayer with me? Praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our lives and asking for God to give us his vision for our world at this time. Because I know that if we receive God's vision, that his vision is one that will infuse our hearts and minds with love for each other and for the people in Pendleton and in Pilot Rock and in the entire Pacific Northwest. And I know that the vision that God is going to give us is one that is going to wake us up from our sleep, empower us with God's love, bring us together on a mission to love others in a way that brings them to Jesus. I want to be part of that. I hope that you want to be part of that too. Let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you for this service today. I want to thank you for each and every person here. I want to thank you for the beautiful songs that lifted you up. I want to thank you for the children's story that brought a smile to my face and put a song in my heart. And I want to thank you for the young people that are serving in this church. Lord, I want to thank you for each and every single member who's reached out to me over the last couple of weeks and has offered prayer. As I looked at the story in the scripture today, I felt so blessed that because of your sacrifice, God, that I know people who care enough, even in a time where I'm struggling and going through things, to reach out and pray for me and pray with me. Lord, I want to thank you for this opportunity to be a part of this community. Lord, I want to pray that you will open up my heart and my mind even more to love each and every single member of this church and this community in a way that will teach me how to lead them, serve them, and bring them together with your vision so that we can be on a mission of relieving the suffering of the people in Pendleton and Pilot Rock. God, show us how to lift you up. Show us how to lay down our lives and let Jesus be lifted up in us so that we can reach men and women and boys and girls for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everybody. God bless.